Welcome to Liner Notes, a podcast about how scholars plan and stay organized and the tools they use. In each episode, I'll be interviewing a scholar about what's in their pen case, or something akin to a pen case if they don't have one, how they plan their time, and their secrets to an organized scholarly life. I'm Catherine Ride Jewell, a historian and professor of history at Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. Our guest today is Hillary Green. She is currently Van Professor of Ethics and Society for the year academic year 2020 to 2021, and before that, worked as an associate professor in the Department of Gender and Race Studies at the University of Alabama. She has a PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, an MA in history from Tufts University, and a BA in history with minors in Africana Studies and Pre-Healing Arts from Franklin and Marshall College. Her work explores the intersection of race, class, and gender in pre-1920 African-American history, Reconstruction Studies, and Civil War Memory. Her first book, Educational Reconstruction, African-American Schools in the Urban South, 1865 to 1890, published by Fordham University Press in 2016, explored how African-Americans and their white allies created, developed, and sustained a system of African-American education schools during the transition from slavery to freedom in Richmond, Virginia, and Mobile, Alabama. Her in-progress second book focuses on how African-Americans remembered and commemorated the American Civil War and its legacy. In January 2015, she created the Hallowed Grounds Project for exploring the history of race, slavery, and memory at the University of Alabama in the post-emancipation developments in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We recorded this episode on February 1st, 2021, the first day of Black History Month. Welcome, Hillary. Hello! <laughs> I'm so thrilled that you're here, because I have to say that you are one of my internet inspirations <laughs> for, uh, inter- for for writing accountability, for your systems, for, you know, I'm so, I have so many questions for you, so I can't wait. That I hope I can answer and kind of share my method to my madness that <laughs> I go right in. So I start with segment one, which is what's in your pen case, assuming you have one. I hear it. (laughs) And pick three of your must-haves. So for me, my case is a Kate Spade bag that it has a vinyl outside with a cloth interior. And the reason why I do that, I'm always afraid that when my handy items, a pen might break and spill all over my clothes or cloth bags. So for me, having that um, case that is waterproof, just in case I spill anything on it, and contain it at least two to three pens, and typically black, but my other favorite is green. I like to edit my work in either green or purple pens. So I always have a green or purple pen in there, uh, because red just, I can't look at, it looks like it's bleeding on the page. (laughs) So having that there. And then the other thing that's my must have item is my adapter for my Mac. So wherever I go to a conference, I always have at least a couple of pens, my adapter, just in case I need to use it or someone needs to borrow it. And then um, pens for editing. And so what do you, are you a felt tip or a ballpoint? For me, I like the gel, but honestly, it doesn't matter. I take as many pens as I can get from hotels and other things else because my students always take my pens. And I start off with this really beautiful set of pens in my office. And by the end of like two weeks, they're gone because students come in without it. And I'm just like, take it, have it. <laughs> so for me, I buy the gel uh tip ones whenever they're on sale at Target. But I pick up, hotel, I have a lot of hotel pens, right? <laughs> Those are all big and you're just like, I don't care. I wanna to touch on the editing process, but also the note taking process. Like how do you take notes on books? For me, and this is why, um, so I use the pens for editing, I use the pens for writing, and I use the pens for note taking. So I cannot read and take notes on a computer. I, when I start doing my research methods, like having a laptop with a luxury. So for me, I always have those little mini notepads and I hand write my notes. So I always have three things for any book that I'm reading for, for my research. The title, I have a space for the argument. And then for every chapter, I try to summarize the what I just read in one to two sentences. So I have it there. I always note the organization. I then type those notes out. So until I type them, those handwritten notes are always put in the front of the books. So every time I read a book for a second time or a third time, 
I look at that, but sometimes it's different the second time I'm reading it or the third time so I'm asking new questions. I do the mm-hmm. same thing. So it's it gets less and less over time, but then I update that Word document. So I have all my handwritten notes then get typed in. I love it for cons because cons, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you read so many books, you're like, oh, but I have ha- typed up once. By having that argument up there and then who they're in conversation and my commentary on like, yay, why well, I really like like something or really a question mark <laughs> so I put all of that in there the reason why I write by hand and not in a book and then type is because I had a work study job at Franklin Marshall College where I had to erase marginalia from library books I never thought about that <laughs> and honestly it was in book repair but when you had to have a cart of books that people wrote in that were library books and you're the one who has to erase it you kind of stop writing your books and then recall i could never recall what i had but having that paper that tangibility i'm like oh yeah page here like a flipping class but the eraser of the book that still gets me every single time i sit there i'm like Mm, no. And so for me, that active art of reading and writing, and I can be taking notes. I don't even have to look at the page anymore as I'm writing them. It's like this, but I always put my thoughts, brief summaries, the page number, and I'm like, oh, good quote, or use in this chapter, use here. That method that helps with the writing and the edit, because I have that commentary already. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I wanted to use that. I could find it real quickly. I like it also produces like an intellectual, your, your intellectual history of the book itself. Yeah. Like you use it you the notes for this one purpose. And then you're keeping mm-hmm. evolution of like how you relate to that book. Yeah. So when I give my books out to my students, the first thing I have to do is open up the front, take the notes out of it. Because when I type it up, I print out the type copy. So I have the handwritten copy. I had to type copy that's correct of any typos in there and then I have to take that out. So that's how I know student books are gone oh. because I have a stack of them. And I'm like, okay, such and such has this. When I get back, I put stuff back in. I'm like, okay, put it on the shelf. Gosh, it's like a little card like <laughs> catalog <laughs> for your personal library. Yes. You know, there's sort of this idea that like, oh, like we should share our notes, share the labor, right? Mm-hmm. But it really ends up not working that way because we have to form our own relationship. And that's why that one to two sentence um, summary of the book. So when I had my comp notes, so the first page would be the argument, um, organization, the summaries, who were there in conversation. I could share that page. Everything else was personal to me. So it broke down sharing, but I found uh, some of my friends during grad school really liked it because I did that for every single class. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, wait. This is working. This is, <laughs> you have this. And they saw the benefits. They started doing it. And when I teach grad students at um, Alabama, I'm just like, you're going to have to do a master's level comps. Just start getting your notes here and having it usable so you have that one page to jog your memory. And then whatever you need the rest of the book for, those are your notes. Those are your readings. Those are the things that you're talking back to the text with. There is something about like, that happens with the process of reflection when you're making those notes. That dialogue, it helps in also how I'm intervening into the literature. One of the things I like about that process is then when I write, I have my handwritten notes right there. I have my typed up primary source notes right there. And then I have either a notepad or my Word document. I'm working on this. I'm like, let me go through here. It's like the signal so I can see back and forth and the process really has multi-uses, but it starts with that first read. So when you're writing a chapter or you're outlining a chapter, how do you pull all of that together? I organize my documents all by word. So I have my secondary literature stuff and then my primary one. So I start with pad and paper and I start sketching and I'm like, vignette, this is why I want to this is what I'm thinking about arguing here and then the sections and then over time that outline I go back to it because as I'm pulling things together I'm like oh no I need to get here or is this really necessary I always have the word document and then the type document here if I start with paper and I sketch it out and I'm very visual 
So in my office at Bama, I have a very large whiteboard. So I have a full outline of the book on that. And I have in progress or not. So whatever the status is. And then I have the little chapters at a time where I'm working on at the particular moment. But I find the white page of a Word document sometimes is a stumbling block for me. Mm -hmm. So if I do free write it or I'm stuck over a thing and I'm like, okay, this is why I was posted right here. Let me get the paper out. Let me get this. Go back to the notes. Go back to the notepad. So when I go back the next day to type, I type that in first. And then that sets me off for the rest of the day. And because I outline, I don't write all the time in order. Because sometimes I have, um, especially, and I'm a drafter. So I do multiple drafts. So as I'm going through and I'm reading through, I'm like, oh, wait, I need to write this section. But this is going to require me to do a little bit more reading because right now the analysis isn't there. I do in bold light. Come back here. <laughs> this is what you're saying you're supposed to do. Go to the next section until I do the necessary holes. But sometimes some sections of the chapter are easier to write than others. So by doing multiple drafts, that revision process, I'm constantly revising, I'm constantly writing. In the end, it gets easier to edit. And this is why having the pens matter. Because one of the things I have to do is I keep hard copy. I can't edit on the screen. I print out. And printing out and having marked up copies actually saved me <laughs> recently. Oh. Because in October, I had a flash drive crash and I lost 15 pages of a chapter. But I had two hard copies of sections that I had pre-wrote and I had edited out that I still had. I went back to that and typed all that stuff back in and they're like, okay, now we have to go back to what was I doing? But it ended up being a blessing because for me, I looked at what I had, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. So I had to edit and I actually streamlined <laughs> another page because at the second reading, look at that, I'm like, this was me here, but right now, because I've written stuff afterwards, this doesn't make sense here anymore. So it helped in that. So it's that constant dialogue and drafting. And for me, pen to paper, either at the writing stage, the outlining stage, or the editing stage before I get to the screen. And having that printed copy for either backup, but also too, when I don't want to look at the screen anymore. In COVID, I'm over screen time. Like I'm <laughs> over this. So having that paper and sitting out and just marking up the page. It's like that, um, you know, the dialogue that you then have with your own writing. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm a reverse outliner. Like that tends to be mm. what I do on paper the most in the editing process. And like, sometimes I'll do it as sticky notes and then like, yeah. it, like oh really? Like this needs to go here. Or like I'll do it by part or like by, mm -hmm. by chapter section. But I really like that reverse outlining process on the actual physical paper because then I can like, you know, arrows and- And I have that all the time and you can see that. And I have like my own notations and this is where the writing process and the reading process is so personal to me mm -hmm. that when I try to explain to people, I'm like, yeah, I'm a paper person but when you look at my notes, you can see my, my mental process in doing this. And also the writing. If for me, writing's a process. By me constantly being of the project and thinking about the project and writing on paper, it helps me think. I'm like, you know what? This makes sense back over here. So I have arrows pointing. And actually this sort of leads me to segment two about planning your, how you plan your time in your work and, you know, paper digital. I have been inspired by you to adopt the research journal. For me, one of the things that would stress me out is I would plan what I intended to do for the day and then not do it. And then the other thing is I get random thoughts about sections at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, and I will get up and just write out. So I have a journal next to my bed for the middle of the night inspiration. And I'm doing this without my glasses, typically. I date the time <laughs> and then I start handwriting. Now I use my phone function in the notes to do that so I can email it to me. I, so I have these two things in there because thoughts and ideas come randomly. So always have an a centralized place to have those notes in there. So it's not just the back of an envelope. Mm -hmm. It's not just a scrap of paper. It is actually one coordinated place. And then the other thing that I adopted, um, and I adopted this th three years ago, and it was because of teaching and not being able to write during an academic year. 
that I started saying, instead of writing what I hope to write, instead of document what I did achieve. And if I could only manage a half an hour, we're going to make that half hour work. So I started writing a half hour a day uh, minimum. And some days it's more because I'm not teaching. Some days it's um, I'm never less than a half hour. And it could be outlining, it could be editing, it can be writing, but I'm doing a half hour every day. When I started doing that, I stopped beating myself up about I wasn't writing enough. I wasn't making progress. I'm feeling behind. Instead, I could look back and be like, oh no, I did this every day. And I started seeing progress every day to the various projects um, that I'm writing. For me now, because I'm on leave, I've been writing a half an hour to 45 to an hour every morning. And in the afternoon, I've been doing the same. And so every day of this calendar became a it's a chronicle of what I achieved that day. And that switch over hope to versus achieving helped with some of the self-doubt, imposter syndrome, and just feeling like I wasn't getting enough done. It has also helped me set up for the next day. So sometimes on those calendars, I'm like, oh, I did this. I've said, and tomorrow you will enter this. So when I come in the first day, I was like, okay, I said I was going to enter this. We're going to enter this first. <laughs> I'm going to do this. Yeah. And it's been great because it helped with my accountability. This sense of I wasn't writing enough because I'm my own worst critic. I'm mm -hmm. always thinking I'm not doing enough. I'm too slow. And I'm thinking like, no, I'm really involved in the writing process. And I'm deeply thinking about these projects and some things they take more time. They take more energy, but it goes from the reading to the draft into the editing. And in the end, I, I feel like my writing and my process that I've had support and it's gotten better over time. It is something that I'm like, okay, every day, little step here and at the end it accumulates. So when I take a break and I do take breaks, <laughs> I write in my calendar, took Thanksgiving off. I feel no guilt about taking that week off or when we had conferences and when you when we used to have conferences in person <laughs> before this pandemic and my, writing schedule will be off, I put, so I'm like, oh no, we were here. But I stopped feeling guilty for not writing. I feel, I feel like there's stages of the book where the word mm -hmm. count tally helps me, yeah. but most of the process is really not about word count. And I feel like this, this sort of approach, it helps quantify, not, you know, qualify, I guess, yeah. qualitative approach, rather than quantitative of the word count. Yeah, I started with the word count and that felt overwhelming. And it felt, actually it didn't help me enough because especially when you edit, you're like, oh, wait, I, got those I, words. <laughs> I took out words, but those words needed to be cut. Yeah. <laughs> so it started, in, and sometimes I'll do the net words. So instead of the words, it became how much time and what did I do with that time? It became less stressful, but also to more productive for me. And it works definitely for me on here. And I stopped feeling guilty. And then I have to tell people too, do not judge your progress against my progress mm -hmm. <laughs> because we all have our own measures and metrics. And for me, I look at the national news and stress, I respond by writing and putting my thoughts down and words down in the analysis down on a page. Other people do it differently. And I started to realize my journey, my path is definitely mine. And I can share this, but it's not one way to get to the end product. I hope in these conversations that people can be, you know, cons comparison is the thief of joy, but mm -hmm. you know, by looking at what other people are doing, it can then spark that creativity. Be like, oh, but this yeah. is what works for me. Yeah, and I like that a lot because I think the word, the 500 word challenge and everything else helped in my mind to start to document mm -hmm. what I was doing the day during the academic year. So it's like, I do a boot camp during breaks because that's why I can write. But what happens if I just carve out a half hour? Because if I could do, 500 words in an hour or less, that's about an hour a day. So I started calculating that. When can I do that hour? And then I cut it down to a half hour. I was, because honestly, the academic year is some of the hardest time to write. And an hour is a luxury. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? Sometimes I only have 30 minutes between classes and that's it. And that's going to be my time. And you know what? It's going to be okay. 
Right. I mean, you can, you can, you can get a paragraph, yeah. an idea clarified in a paragraph in that amount of time. And that then will lead you to the next one. Or if you can put in edits, if you have it on paper, you can put those edits in that you already had on the paper within a half hour. But if that's all you had for that day, because you're teaching all day, student meetings, meetings with service, mm -hmm. everything else, you're like, oh, okay. Because no one has eight hours anymore after grad school. No. <laughs> just to sit down and just write. <laughs> And this is where time is precious. And so I started dedicating myself to the 30 minutes write-in minimum. And I also dedicated my time to self-care mm -hmm. in that process. But I had to start scheduling both write-in and me and my voice in that process. And because I have that limited time, what I do in that time has been there and very productive for me. And then I stopped feeling guilty. I absolutely stopped feeling guilty and I had to put things on to the next day. But I'm like, you know, I'm in a good spot right now because I'm constantly thinking and writing and everything's coming together. And the same thing with the reading. I add reading in that time because I think reading's a part of the writing process. So for me, all of that in there and then having the calendar and then also the notes has helped a ton because I have stumbling blocks even this long out. And for me, all these help me continue to be constantly writing, thinking about writing, and then actually doing the process of editing and revising. So for segment three, mm -hmm. I feel like I feel like you've got some, some some secrets to share here. So what is what's a secret that you can share to this productive, organized, scholarly life? So two things. One, when I write in the morning, you'll see me with my coffee. And I always post on social media, hi, here's my coffee. This is what I'm doing. And I started that early on to let my family know, don't call me. I'm not responding to your emails. I won't respond to your tweets. An hour later, then I come back, I'll surface back up. And then if you see me retweeting, you know it's okay to give me a break. <laughs> but the other was, um, I started doing this, especially when I moved to Alabama from Elizabeth City State University. Coffee shops in the afternoon, for me, don't work. They're too loud. There's no tables. No table. and there are no tables. And I'm like, oh, I can't do any work. But the local bars and breweries in Tuscaloosa all have Wi-Fi. And that's where all the business people work. So you can go to a place, three o'clock, buy a pint, get your free Wi-Fi, and you see no one but other people write it around you. And we're all nursing that drink because we're actually writing. But when we're done, that beer is good. <laughs> That's why it's good. And so editing and having my morning writing spots out of the house, my afternoon writing spots, but also to use of social media to tell people I am not responding to you. So, but also to like, hey, you see what I'm doing? And so this is the funniest thing now with Twitter, which I'm newer to um, I posted all the people who I owe stuff to. They also know I'm working on progress. They're like, oh, I see you're writing. Okay, we're good. <laughs> we see your things in there. Oh, we saw you reading this book. And then other people, um, I was, I got delayed because of um, this pandemic on a couple projects and moving to Davidson. They, I'm like, I'm working on it. It's coming. And then I apologize. They're like, yeah, we tracked your progress on social media. So removing the veil, but also people realizing I have very clear writing spots, but the afternoon pints, glass of wine with the book or the text, and I'm usually edited at those places or reading. People start to realize like, wait a minute, you really are reading all these books. <laughs> You really are taking all these notes at the same time. So I try to get the note page on you. I'm just not reading to read. I'm actually showing that. Yeah, it's the sure. it's the removing of the veil, and to show people like it is possible to still do this. In the end, treat yourself, reward yourself, but know that writer process doesn't have to mean you just hold up in a small space and not being out. Yeah, and that you don't have to have necessarily like perfect writing conditions mm -hmm. that you can, you, it works into all of these different spaces in your life throughout the day. 
Yeah, and COVID really made um, possible me going outside. I I love my house. I, I can't write at home. I'm really bad at writing at home. And when you're in a space 24-7 and you're like, I need air. I need to get out. So <laughs> growing up in New England, so I'm from Boston originally, I could sit outside. I'm like, you got a heater? Okay, it's 40 degrees. We out here. Having that, but his health with also me dealing with the pandemic and finding this. And once I realized all these outdoor spaces were possible at my coffee shop or um, some of the bars and breweries, I was like, oh. We're, we're back because I struggled without having that routine. Yeah. I'm like, where am I supposed to write? How am I supposed to write? <laughs> Look, I have to readjust. But this is where that 30 minutes a day came in. And measuring where I was achieving the what I was achieving that day, it helped me like, no, I'm still writing. It doesn't seem like I'm writing, but I am writing. And I'm still doing this work. And it reminded me when doubts started coming in. But for me, breweries wineries, being outdoors, best right places ever. And now everyone has Wi-Fi. Yeah. Get out of the coffee shop in the afternoon. Just get out. When I started discovering that, and I discovered it kind of at Chapel Hill, Tyler, um, Tyler's Tap Room, which is no longer open. They closed this year. Mm -hmm. But I, I kept on running into people. The other thing is, so I started doing coffee shops in Tuscaloosa and even in Davidson. I run into people all the time. And I'm like, I need to get work done. This is not a social time. <laughs> so I most people don't follow me to other things. But now they know I'm there. So I do have people on occasion know where my writing spots are and actually track me down there. <laughs> where I'm, meeting. I'm just like, you know, I'm writing. Like, I get this page <laughs> done. I'm not on social media right now. I send my email. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, love, I, I love your I love your approach to social media too. It's very empowering. You know, instead of it being like this time suck, it's like, no, I'm gonna use it as a tool. Yeah, and also that's when I it because social media can be such oof. Yeah. But social media has also helped me because it is Black History Month today. Yay! <laughs> and um, but it has helped me think through ideas. And so when people see the books I'm reading and they're understanding the writing, they're seeing what's informing my process. Mm -hmm. um, today for Black History Month, I am showcasing, for the month I'm showcasing some of my research, but also um, I collect early African-American photography. Today's image is actually featured in one of the chapters I just discussed, because I am talking about the, lim um, it's a book on Civil War memory and how African-Americans remember the Civil War. And this mother and daughter took a souvenir photograph to commemorate their time at the Negro building at the Jamestown Tercentennial. But you see them, they're in like these beautiful white dresses, their hair's done, but they took the act to take their photograph, buy the souvenir sleeve, and preserve it to document that they existed and to document their idea of progress since emancipation that countered the lost cause, that countered everything else. But they did this by a simple, inexpensive technology. And I also have a postcard that was someone carefully preserved in their scrapbook because you still see the photo cards were colored. And I'm like, and, and I got it at an estate. I don't know the names of the people, um, but that image and the postcard came together. And I just keep on thinking, I'm like, what did it mean to buy this this item and to do this photography, but also to create their own archive? And how can I use this to counter what else is going on at that time? So that um, image ended up being part of this chapter that I just finished. And it's just a few things, but to talk about the event where it was the main organizer. So I'm focused on, but I'm like, no, people actually attended. They thought it was successful. They actually did these acts that you normally would think in terms of leisure. And we never think about that. When we talk about memory, we think about, oh, the lost cause is so dominant. We always say, yeah, I'm like, but no, African-Americans are still engaging in these very public and performative ways. And what more performative than black photography? So using social media to highlight, like, not only, hey, here's my archival source I'm using, but this is what I'm thinking about it and how I'm thinking about it. So all of that helps with the writing process. And it's like you're continuing sort of in that process that those people started. Yes. In telling that story. You're 
you're like the next phase of it. I love it. It's wonderful. Yeah. So for this one, I'm going to have more photography of my own collection, um, some campus history um, research that I'm doing at the University of Alabama on the Hallow Grounds tour. And then a little bit of the book stuff that, so people know what I'm doing, but not too much because I want them to read the book. But sometimes the tweets help and the posts help, especially when I'm thinking like, how would I respond? Like, how should I, I'm arguing this? And it's direct engagement that I know I'm like, okay, I'm on the right path. It's like my classroom. Yes. Totally. I could tell from researching my students if they're, if my thinking of an argument or writing or analysis is correct because they have their body language mm -hmm. and we have questions. Social media is another platform for me to do that. Well, thank you so much for this. This has been so enlightening and interesting. And I'll, I'll make sure to add to the show notes, um, links to the posts that you make for Black History Month. Thank you. And honestly, this has been a wonderful conversation. And thank you for asking because a lot of people have noted on my process, but never asked me to explain the process in here. <laughs> I'm glad to be able to do that. Thank you.